我现在问一个问题哈，你们认为中山是不是学电？是的人请按一，不是的人请按二。你认为中山是不是一个一是不是一间学电？是的人请按一，不是的人请按二。中山是不是一个学电？勇敢的写，勇敢的讲哦。中山是不是学电？是的人请按一，不是的人请按二。你们不是花钱在买学位吗？不然你来是为了干什么？你不是为了换那张文凭吗？学电是你自己定义的，用你自己自己觉得的认知来定义它。来哟、哦，中山是不是学电？是的，请按一，不是的，请按二。我应该请校长坐在旁边看这一题哦。我有很多问题都想请他来做，不过不敢，请他来之后可能就被开除了。好，来介绍一下答案。刚刚是说不是的，请按二，是的，请按一，是不是？好，来我来。好奇一下，调查一下。呃，零与零在哪边？你觉得呢？是不是？你觉得是？哦，为什么？因为最近的那个雪山有点涨价。嗯。大概是。因为雪山涨价，你就觉得它是雪电了。全国好像只有两间不是学店呢、欸，但一间，第一间叫慈济，让你愿意吃素；第二间叫做呃长庚大学，他们规定有他们有限价格。好，所以于林觉得说，因为学餐太贵了，所以算学店。好，还有谁可以分享一下？我们再来看一下。哦，飓风在哪边？你觉得呢？中山算不算学店？我觉得不是学店。为什么？因为国立的，所以不算。呃，这当然，我觉得这一方面其实就现实面来讲，就是这是一个第一个第一个条件。那一方面的话，我觉得其实毕竟我们还是有许多的知名校友，然后还是有许多有有教学热忱的老师跟学生在这里，所以我觉得因为这比例相当占的相当多，所以所以我觉得不能算是一个学店。好，谢谢。好，再来再抽再抽最后一个，嗯、呃。挺好在哪边？挺好。啊？他请假？哦，他没有跟我请。好，先记起来。好。静华，静华，对不起，你觉得呢？哦，为什么？很好。原本想说是七十八跟二十八八，然后想要变变三十。哈哈哈哈哈！下去了，下去了，这个怎么意思？我听不懂。反正我觉得有些课程是，然后有些老师。什么课程叫做学电课程？我听不懂。你你不要告诉我哪一门课，你要告诉我什么样的课程会被你归类成。做行销不就是这样子吗？<笑>我们叫气管系耶。就是就是、就是、因为毕竟做行销还是要有一些自己产品的特色，他连特色都没有。特色，他的特色就是没有特色啊。<笑>也是啦，但是<笑>但是我觉得什么？一定会有一个核心价值在。就是。就是你进来给你高分加出去，这样不是很很快乐？没有高分，所以他没拿到高分。哦，所以他的错误是他没有给高分，是他的错误。有可能没有，他就是又学不到东西之外，然后又又没给高分。然后我们做一堆事情，然后他评断的标准也不一，没有没有这个标准。哦，好，好，好。好哪一门课？来，那我就要再问下一个问题喽。你们觉得学校学校要赚到足够的钱，去有所谓的基本的获利，这个部分重不重要？
，觉得对这样子要问好，先删掉。学校作为学校这样子的教育机构，我们应该要有获利的，请按一；不应该的，请按二。应该要有获利的，请按一；不该的，请按二。来看一下大概的结果。哦，有趣。好，刚才抽那边，我们先用抽一下，抽两个再来打好了。不用，没关系。我也要。分享。谢谢谢谢。示威，你觉得呢？该不该获利 ？OK， 为什么学校该获利？为什么他要赚钱？学校是个商业组织吗？那为什么学校必须要赚钱？以防不时之需，所以要赚钱。所以连政府都要赚钱，连社会局都要赚钱，连疗养院都要赚钱，是像这样子吗？好，我们再来看下一个哦。哦，四十一。加字在哪边？你觉得呢？我觉得需要获利啊，因为为什么？呃，毕竟学校也是个组织，虽然它是挂名是国立的一个学校，但是它的财政的盈余跟它的健康程度，代表这个学校它的体制上，体制上是不是呃完整，然后没有冗呃冗员还是有啊？但是，是他在处理其他事情上面就会有更多的容错的空间，还有比较多发展跟呃跟其他。可是我要资源的话，我有两种方式。第一种方式是我从你们身上赚到更多的钱；第二种方式是我去跟政府靠北一下，就拿到一笔钱。所以，我很简单的方式之一是，我去跟高雄大学说，来跟教育部说，我跟高雄大学合并，好，教育部就说我给你十亿，这样不是快多了？我只要讲这句话，我就有十亿；我写个计划书就有十亿，会不会快多了？所以对于学校来讲，当我今天可以跟从你们身上，例如像我把你们学分费调到跟 EMBA 一样高，来赚钱，这这样子做比较好，还是说我去跟政府要钱比较好？政府要钱，那就不是透过营运活动来做了，然后过补助的方式来做。所以从这个情形之下的话，你觉得学校应该要追求获利吗？如果我们把获利当成是。从我们的一般的营业或者营运活动当中来赚取经费的话，呃，原本我在刚才打这题的时候，我的获我的刚才获利我是资源的获取，认为是对，是除了资源获取，代表还有就财政上要有盈余，是抱持这个态度。如果如果老师的意思很明确是指商业 ，OK， 所以是我刚才并没有把东西讲清楚，我知道了，那是我我这边的问题，对，因为其实我强调的并不只是商业活动，我指的是日常营运活动这个部分。好，谢谢。好，那如果这样子的话，我们大概大概已经听到了一些讲法。那我们来，我来问一下，有没有人觉得学校不应该获利的人分享一下好不好？因为这个蛮重要的。有没有任何的人觉得学校不该获利的，愿意分享一下？啊，我觉得学校就是非营利性组织，就是它的作用是起到一个教育作用。嗯。然后，呃，它所有就是，其实就是所有的国立的大学其实是没有在营业的。就呃，他们呃获取资金大多是靠政府，就像您刚才所说，靠政府所获得一些资金的补助吧。嗯，所以我觉得他不应该盈利，他是一个服务于。因为只要是政府，对，它并不是以企业组织的形式成立。它是一个非盈利。非盈利组织，好，谢谢，好。来，我们接下来会请各位看一部影片。那我们刚刚该问的问题是，应该是来自于说是，因为我先讲实话好了，跟我预期完全不一样。我本以为你都会告诉我说，学校这种地方不应该赚钱的，它不应该以赚钱为本质，我才带得下去。就后来发现答案都跟我想的完全不一样。不过没有关系，我们来看另外一个东西。有没有想过一件事情？如果我把中山大大学拿来上市的话，你觉得好不好？我先讲一下上市的条件好了哈。台湾上市的条件很简单，例如像你要有一定一定时间的一个的一个呃的一个营业的历史，中山有了嘛哈，二十几年了。二，你要有多少年的一个获利的状况？等等，中山其实基本上到现在校务基金还有剩，所以表示应该
每年都要赚到一点钱。所以这样子的话，把中山上来做作为对外募资，我们应该可以获得更多的钱了。你们觉得这样好不好？觉得好的人，好一样投票好了。觉得这样子不错的人，请按一。把中山拿来公开上市，比较好的人请按一。把中山，中山不应该公开上市，继续来当国立大学的，请按二。来看一下答案。哎，大部分的人都觉得不要。好。嗯，玉轩在哪边？你觉得呢？你觉得要不要？为什么？因为我觉得学校毕竟也是一个教育的地方，如果拿来上市上柜的话，他补习班不也可以上市上柜？他不也是教育的地方？就是毕竟补习班，我觉得补习班跟学校就是比较不一样。一个是可以赚钱的，一个一个是人家私人的地方，补习班是私人，然后我觉得学校算是一个比较公众一点的公。嗯哼。所以我就把它透过上市的手段，让社会大众都持有我们公司、持有我们学校的一个部分，让我们成为，让我们把权力从政府的手中转移到人民的手中。听起来会不会觉得很很很很很激昂？所以我觉得这样子可能最后有可能会变得太盈利，因为毕竟大家如果想要买学校股份的话，他们就会去想要盈利一为导向。是。对，所以我觉得变就会变得初衷会变得不一样。哦哈，好，谢谢，好，再来一个是呃，刚子，再来是，对，国少在哪边？国少改到这一班了，国少，哦、oh, ，不在，好，记起来，然后再下。可是，俊祥在哪边？哦，你觉得呢？我们上市的目的不是以不是目上市只是手段，让我们赚更多的钱。啊哈。你不觉得高铁也可以上市了吗？高铁，高铁是吧？对对对。高铁上不上市的，因为因为补习班，其实补习班最主要的目的，可能不是为了教育，他可能不是为了教育，下嗯，他他主要目的不是为了教育，搞不好主要目的是为了赚钱。哦，哎、欸，这边出过补习班的人不少哈，你觉得补习班的目的是什么？刚刚有人告诉我说，他不是为了教育，是为了赚钱，所以你们去那边是给他钱，是不是？对。好、哦，那你们换到了什么？换到了这一间学校，是不是？好，来，没有关系。来，接下来我们请各位看一部影片。这部影片在讲的事情是说，在美国那边，真的有一些大学现在已经上市了。我们来看一下这样子的大学是怎么样运作的。我们再讨论一下这个这个议题，好不好？开始。嗯
Clifford is building an empire. Was it Mark Twain that said, don't let college get in the way of your education? He invests in failing universities and injects them with large amounts of capital. When they go public, he can make a bundle of money in the process. The regulatory environment has changed so much. One of his schools was involved in a major 2008 IPO on Wall Street, Grand Canyon University. You may never have heard of it, but today it's valued at $1.2 billion. Hello, it's Michael. A former musician who never attended college, Michael Clifford is an unlikely player in the rarefied world of academia. I was doing a lot of cocaine, drinking a lot, smoking a lot of pot from the music business and the club scene. Somebody introduced me to Jesus Christ by reading me the Bible, and it changed my life. I became a born-again Christian, and then my spiritual mentor, a guy named Bill Bright from Campus Crusade for Christ International, sat me down one day and said, you need to get into post-secondary education. And I said, Bill, I've never gone to college. I don't know what you're talking about. Right, right. When I came home and told a couple of my friends that I was going to buy a university, they all said, are you back on crack or something? I mean, no one buys a college. And I said, no, no, I think it can be done. Today, Clifford is part of a movement that is transforming the way we think about higher education in America. He and his investors have turned around a half dozen colleges that now enroll close to 40,000 students. There are people who would say, look, this guy Michael Clifford, he never went to college, he was a musician, he sort of drifted around, he had a born-again experience. Do you have the credibility, do you have the bona fides to be determining the future of colleges around the country? No, I don't, but I'm doing it. And I think that's a great thing only in America. I mean, my new book is called How to Run a College by a Guy That Never Went to One. Clifford doesn't act alone. He attracts some of America's biggest investors, like former GE chairman Jack Welch. According to the Wall Street Journal, Welch invested $2 million in one of Clifford's schools. I invest in bonds and other things. Invest in all these widgets I invested. Private equity. I'm school. How long job It's education. For profit. I like this investment more than anyone I got. <laughs> Traditional colleges raise capital from wealthy alumni and other donations. Yeah. Clifford's for profit schools sell shares to investors. I just think if everybody's going to fund. Clifford's right. latest turnaround project is a small nursing school in the Hispanic section of San Diego. We have probably invested in the neighborhood of six to seven million dollars in the school. Um, it will get as big as we want it to get because the demand for bilingual nursing and other related health care programs is so great. Clifford took over Inter-American College in 2009. It's geared to serve Latinos and he plans to open a string of campuses outside military bases. The students typically hold jobs by day and take classes well into the night to improve their job prospects. Typical student is they're adult students, so their average age might be in their early 30s. They're very career oriented. Um, protein, carbohydrate, and... In the past, these students might have graduated high school and found a good job as a factory worker or a secretary. There was no need for more school. But with the economy changing, they're coming back to school in record numbers. They represent a huge and growing market. It's a phenomenon that leaders of America's community colleges have known for years. In an old industrial section of Queens, New York, the jobs are long gone and students are crowded classrooms. College is now fundamental. If you're going to work, to just simply work, to make it as an adult, you are going to need an education because the economy is about knowledge. But the demand is so great, community colleges can't keep up. There's an explosion of enrollment this year, and most of us have been turning away students. In California, I know it's tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of students who couldn't even come in. How do you meet that demand? What LaGuardia Community College has done and, and other colleges throughout the country has said, Come to us, and when we're full, we're going to shut the door. 
and more and more you're having to do that. We are having to do that. The failure of community colleges to accommodate the demand has given Clifford and others a huge opportunity. Many schools are not meeting the market demand and we have somewhere between 30 and 50 million working American adults who have not finished their college degree. The question is, are for-profit schools the answer? In the 90s, Clifford apprenticed with the undisputed master, the architect of the for-profit model, John Sperling. In 1976, Sperling, a Cambridge University educated humanities professor, turned his back on traditional academia and moved to Phoenix, Arizona. He believed he could mass produce education and run his school more like a corporation than a university. Now his school is everywhere. The University of Phoenix. It's one of the largest universities in the world, enrolling close to a half million students, more than the entire University of California system and all the Ivy League schools combined. I traveled here knowing that the University of Phoenix is wary of the media, but they had agreed to some interviews. Then at the last minute, they backed out and gave no explanation. Instead, I spoke to former Phoenix executives. It was not by accident that this university developed in the Southwest and the West. You know, that's where people go to reinvent themselves, and that's where John reinvented the university. Why did the university need to be reinvented? What's wrong with the way that universities were run up until the time that John Sperling came along with Phoenix? John saw the constraints of most, most college professors. You know, anybody who's got any new ideas in college are quickly beaten down. The academy hasn't had a real change in how it worked for almost 500 years. Mark DeFusco arrived at the University of Phoenix in the mid-90s with a PhD in education from USC, but he quickly embraced the Phoenix model. Phoenix, people go to school all year round. We start classes every five weeks, and instead of starting classes in September and January, we started classes in January and February and March, sometimes too in April. We had more students than we could handle. Go to another site and have some more. We built campuses by a freeway, because we figured that's where the people were. So if you went by any major freeway in the southwest, you're going to find a university of Phoenix campus. We put schools 20 minutes apart, because it's about as far as public could drive and rush out. To keep costs low, the University of Phoenix hired teachers on short-term contracts. They did away with tenure. I didn't have to worry about tenure if they weren't getting to the outcomes I needed, so I just wouldn't give them another contract. And where it takes a traditional university months or years to get a new course approved by faculty, at Phoenix, they could generate one in a matter of days. We would put a group of faculty members, a group of experts, into a room in a hotel for a weekend, and we wouldn't let them out until they came up with a new course. The university was not bound by bricks and mortar, either. Students who couldn't attend the Phoenix campus could log in to courses online. We were designing the coursework around the people who were going to use it. The customer. You bet. It wasn't long before Wall Street took notice. And in 1994, the University of Phoenix and its parent corporation, the Apollo Group, went public. In an otherwise flat market, the stock took off. It was a very exciting time. For the first 15 quarters, we broke records and earnings every every quarter. Apollo Group, this stock is the We were filling in places that no one had ever filled in before. It was a change of an industry. And early managers of Apollo did very, very well. What do you mean by very, very well? They did very, very well. I mean, ultimately, there's not college professors and, and college administrators in this country that did as well as the Apollo administrators. I mean, how much could a college administrator for the University of Phoenix make. The, the sky was the limit. When I left Apollo, a, a, a free country. <laughs> I understand. I understand, but it's posting and I won't say it. 
Well, in terms of how much you make, you did very well. We did very I did, I did better than I ever imagined. Today, Phoenix founder John Sperling is a billionaire, and many of his executives have reaped millions. With money like that to be made, the business model caught fire. It's been replicated across the industry. For-profits offer a range of degrees that focus on career training in the growth sectors, nursing, business management, IT, and education. It's difficult to assess the quality of the degrees. Across all colleges, traditional or for-profit, there's no standard measure imposed on them. But we did talk to satisfied students. I love Grand Canyon and the community that it represents and also the uh, Christian background. This school is just perfect, just it's night classes. I'm studying um, merchandise product development and it is the coolest thing I've ever done in my life. I love it. But I was surprised to learn how expensive tuition at the for-profits is. Five to six times the cost of a community college and as much as twice a four-year state university. On Wall Street, they're a big hit. From a business perspective, it's a great story. You're serving a market that's been traditionally underserved. There is a need for more education, and it's a very profitable business. It generates a lot of free cash flow. So it attracted a lot more financiers, um, and that really helped take the industry to the next level. One of the most successful was Grand Canyon University, the school that Michael Clifford came across in 2004 when it was a small, struggling Christian college. You've got $60 million invested in improvements here in the next three years. Today, under another former University of Phoenix executive, Brian Mueller, the school is flourishing. There's a business school with a brand new building. The nursing program has state-of-the-art facilities. The basketball team is competitive. And the baseball team has a new diamond. Some 40,000 students are now enrolled at Grand Canyon. That's a 400% increase in just a few years. But you won't find the majority of those students here. I hear it. Instead, most of them are here. Uh, yeah. Ninety percent of Grand Canyon students are logging in online from across the country. These servers alone represent 35,000 of them. This is an online university. Is that what it looks like? This is where, other than the people involved, the instructors and the students, this is where they all come together electronically. Online education is incredibly profitable. And how much capacity do you have built in here? How, how big can you go? It allows schools to tap into a wellspring of new students and expand rapidly with the flick of a switch. But we can easily add more servers and take several times this. Several so, times? So, yes. 100, 150,000? Yes. An online course at Grand Canyon costs from $400 to $550 a credit hour. We watched an online class at another school. We were asked and agreed not to show. But for the most part, it's just instructor-led discussion groups. There's little in the way of video or graphics, but it is convenient. The times where I have to work in the morning, I can come home and do schoolwork at night. The times that I work in the afternoon, I get up and I do schoolwork during the day. But some critics of this model worry there may be something lost. The danger, obviously, is a kind of fast foodization of higher education itself where low-cost convenience and ease of, ease of finishing become values in themselves to the possible detriment of the things that only can be accomplished slowly and over time. At Grand Canyon, most of Mueller's profit comes from his online operation, but he still sees the value of anchoring his university in a traditional campus. There is a lot of value in the minds of a teacher in Minnesota that's going to do a master's degree program. She's going to do it online now, even though she's not coming to campus. The fact that it has a traditional campus that looks like the campus that she went to as an undergraduate, 
the fact that the campus is growing and flourishing and has all of the excitement around it is very is, is important. So it builds your brain. It absolutely builds the brain. It's not just a job search, a journey. Beyond building the campus and installing his online servers, Mueller is spending even more money getting the word out. $25 million last year alone. We're all here for a purpose. Find yours. For-profit schools spend a lot on marketing. Whatever your business card says, you're in the business of you. Their ad costs rival those of multinational brands. Which university revolutionized education in America? The granddaddy, University of Phoenix, spent $130 million on ads in 2008. Which university has the largest business school in the country? That's more than brands like Tide, Revlon, and FedEx. Why wait any longer? What they spend on sales and marketing can rival or exceed what they spend on teaching. I want to be the best dad. If you take a look at for-profit colleges, the analysts will tell you that anywhere between 20 and 25 percent of the total revenue of the company is in sales and marketing. About a quarter. In most cases, the faculty are in the 10 to 20 percent range. Should that make us uncomfortable? I don't know. Why, why would we want to be uncomfortable? Well, you're spending more on getting me to come to the school than you are on the service you're providing once I'm there. I understand. Well, is that right? When I go and buy perfume for my mom, the chemicals in the bottle and the bottle itself amount to about 50 cents. The advertising amounts to five or six bucks. But you're not selling perfume. What makes education so special? For-profits have to get people's attention and, and they do a very good job of getting people's attention. Are you thinking about going back to school? Excellent. What are you thinking about going for? In addition to lots of advertising, the industry relies on an army of salespeople. Here, recruiters are working a job fair trying to convince job seekers to come back to school. You had said something about accounting. We have an MBA with an emphasis in accounting. Um, we also have a master's in accountancy, which the for-profits need to continually add students. When you think about it for the uh, University of Phoenix, for example, in order to grow on top of the folks that are leaving, you've got to add the equivalent of, you know, one to one and a half Ohio states per year. The pressure to grow has raised questions about enrollment practices. 2004, 2005, you started to see some companies probably doing things they shouldn't have been doing. Um, you know, going after populations, student populations that maybe did not deserve to go to school. We're not going to succeed in school. Um, they were focusing on enrollments more than the quality. In the early 90s, a congressional investigation accused a number of for-profit schools of employing false or misleading advertising and using illegal recruitment efforts. While some of those schools were shut down, allegations, negative press, and lawsuits continued to dog the industry. We talked to the chief Washington lobbyist for the for-profit schools, Harris Miller. The industry has a black eye, has been struggling for credibility. Why? I don't think the industry has a black eye. I think the sector is doing very well. We're growing by 25% a year, 2.8 million students attending our schools. We have some challenges because there have been some allegations that everything is not perfect. I wish it were. But what about the pressure of Wall Street to, to have them grow? The pressure is to deliver a high education quality for their students. Our schools know that any time they step out of line, there's a huge risk and there's a large focus on compliance at all times, including on enrollment issues. Thank you for calling DeVry University. Hello, we Brian. wanted to find out more about how the enrollment process works. We'd heard complaints about call centers and employees called enrollment advisors using high-pressure sales tactics on prospective students. Then, we got hold of this internal email from RBC University. In it, the director of admissions is writing his team of enrollment counselors. Create a sense of urgency, it says. Push their hot button. Don't let the student off the phone. Die, die, die. Tammy Barker was an enrollment advisor at another for-profit school, Ashford University. 
I didn't realize just how many students we were expected to recruit. And the amount of pressure that they put on you uh, to meet these quotas, I think, challenges anybody's integrity. In a letter to Frontline, Ashford's parent company, Bridgepoint, says they don't have quotas. But Barker says she was instructed to make 150 calls a day and close on at least 12 students a month. If your numbers started dropping, trainers would come around and start telling you to up your outgoing calls anywhere from 300 to 450 a day to meet those quotas, to get those applications. And they used to tell us, you know, dig deep, get to their pain, get to what's bothering them, so that that way you can convince them that a college degree is going to solve all their problems. Another former Ashford enrollment counselor, in a submission to the Department of Education, wrote, we are forced to do anything necessary to get people to fill out an application. Our jobs depend on it. Thank you for calling Ashford University. Bridgepoint says Ashford has zero tolerance for unethical behavior. The focus is to start the student. Whether they're academically ready, whether they're financially ready, they need to start class. Ray Campbell worked as a financial aid advisor at the University of Phoenix. Once a student was recruited, it was his job to hook them up with a loan so they could start paying for classes as quickly as possible. If I put on my report that the student's not ready and they don't start, I would hear it. I would constantly be pressured of why aren't they ready? Is there a way we can start them? What can we do to get them ready? Anyway, it, it, the focus was on this student needs to start, period. Just weeks before this broadcast, the University of Phoenix replied at length to a list of written questions from Frontline. On the question of pressure tactics, they said, should we find an enrollment advisor misleading students, prompt action would be taken, including termination. In the same letter, they wrote, we are committed to financial literacy. Federal student loans are the lifeblood of the for-profit schools. Although their students comprise only 10% of the college-going public, they consume almost a quarter of all federal financial aid. The taxpayers are essentially funding this industry. Something like 75% of their revenue comes from federal grants and loans. The University of Phoenix, which is the biggest for-profit, it now gets 86% of its revenue from the federal government, up from something like 48% nine or 10 years ago. The schools say they're providing opportunity, helping students of modest means pay for college. We educate the students that traditional higher education is given up on. Traditional higher education has become a very socio-demographically elite group of people. If you're not wealthy or upper middle class, you're not going to get into a traditional higher education system. So the only options lower income students and working adults have is either to go to a community college, some of them can go to minority serving institutions, and our option is the third option. What remains troubling is that on average, the debt load for for-profit students is more than twice that of students at traditional schools. Unlike a public community college where a small grant will usually cover most of the tuition, for the for-profit colleges, tuition requires substantial borrowing. So a student who drops out or who doesn't get a high-paying job, sooner or later they have to pay the piper and uh, that can mean tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars in loans that they have to pay back. That's what happened to Ann Cobb. I had two young girls and I was trying to find odd jobs. My ex at that time went bankrupt, so all the bills actually rolled over onto me. In 1994, Ann Cobb was a 35-year-old single mother making less than $8,000 a year and living on food stamps when an enrollment advisor from the University of Phoenix helped her get a student loan. It was just such an incredibly simple process. I mean, it was done a few places here and, you know, we'll let you know and I'm sure you'll be approved. And I said, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I have a lot of bills. Is, is it still going to be okay? Oh, yeah, no problem. No problem at all. Don't worry about it. Just sign here. Cobb graduated in 1999 with over $30,000 in debt. 
over the course of a decade with deferments, consolidations, and penalties, and an interest rate that has gone as high as 14%, the amount now due has ballooned to over $60,000. You never hear these stories. You hear the happy stories with the double car garage and the great house and everything else. You don't hear these horror stories. Cobb is not the only person with large student debt. There are many like her. And this has some people worried. The concern is that they're bringing in students who can't succeed or graduate, loading them with debt. And the for-profit college is not the one that is on the hook. It's you and me. It's the taxpayer. It's the federal government. I know you're worried about the complexity of it, but a plan to split the baby makes a lot of sense to me. Michael Clifford is always in search of his next big deal. I'll never get an opportunity like this anywhere in the rest of his life, period. We're on our way to a meeting for his latest potential acquisition. Well, I'm going to push Gary hard today. <laughs> we wanted to see what it takes to revive a failing college. Thank you, sir. Call me good evening. Thank you. What is it that you do that turns a school from a distressed operation to a successful one? Well, what I feel I do is I bring the three M's, money, management, and marketing. Money, management, and marketing. That's what it takes, combined with passion, to turn around the schools. Clifford has found a school in Oakland, California, that has fallen on hard times. Patton University is like many small colleges across the country who have seen their endowments disappear during the recession. President Gary Moncher wants to save Patton, but without an immediate influx of cash, Patton may not make it through the year. Patton's at the crossroads. With the economic turndown, uh, we lost almost 50% in, in in our, in our asset, I mean, literally dropped from $10 million uh, equity to $5 million. And the future didn't look very bright. So the question is, are we going to be passive and see what happens, or are we going to try to be proactive? Despite its dire predicament, Patton still has one very valuable asset, something called regional accreditation. For the most part, a regionally accredited school is considered a higher quality school. The Harvard's is regionally accredited, but so is DeVry, so is University of Phoenix, the same type of accreditation that the Ivy League schools have. Um, so if you can find an underperforming traditional school with regional accreditation, that's a very valuable property. We had to do appraisals on what regional accreditation is worth for Wall Street, and the independent appraisers came up with a number that a school was worth $10 million because it cost $10 million 10 years and a 50-50 chance of success to obtain regional accreditation. So that accreditation is a very valuable thing. It is. Once you have accreditation, you qualify for the student loan program. And that's what Clifford needs. Accreditation is the key to unlocking federal financial aid funds. I heard about Patton University from one of the regional accrediting executives who said, we really like this school. We're very concerned about its future financially. Would you go talk to him, Michael? And I kept looking at Pat and wondering, what can I do with this school? I kept working on it. And then it hit me like a ton of bricks that it was the perfect fit for the Dream Center. Dream Center is a nonprofit Christian mission associated with the Angelus Temple, a megachurch near downtown LA. Since its founding in 1994, the Dream Center has been a hit with Christian teenagers from across Southern California. Michael Clifford is on its board of directors. The Dream Center is housed in a former hospital. It acts as a 24-hour rehab facility and shelter for ex-convicts, drug addicts, and prostitutes. But if Clifford can make his deal with Patton, Dream Center will also include a fully accredited Dream Center College. We are now in process of working towards this fall launching Dream Center College because of Michael's hard work. If we take a process.
prostitute off the street or an ex crips or blood member. We bring them into our programs and we start an education process. Let me make sure I understand. So the gang member, the former gang member or prostitute or whoever it is that comes to you, a homeless person, can get a college loan for an education. Absolutely. And it's not just the people in the shelter that Clifford's interested in, it's the social workers too. We did a lot of market research and we believe that there's a gigantic market for us in Los Angeles of the 19 to 25 year old who would like to get a degree but would like to help people hands on. So you're going to be able to connect both the people that are providing, the, the, the social workers, with a, with a loan. Uh, and, and get them on a degree path at yes. this Dream Center University. And you're going to be able to take some of their clients, the former gang members and prostitutes, and get them a college loan. Exactly. In the Dream Center conference room, I sat in on a meeting with Clifford and Patton's president as they tried to work out the final details of their deal. What are the big barriers to the deal? Let's put the turds on the table or whatever reason. Here's kind of like, if I could simplify it, sure. Michael, and I like the fact you get right to the bottom line. I can't think of a more exciting opportunity for Patton to be yeah. involved in this work. We just need to move on in some way that makes sense to you. Absolutely. Well, it always takes more money and longer time. I mean, if we think it's going to cost $2 million, it's going to cost $5 million. If we think it's going to be in two years, it's going to be five years. It, it always is that way. It's an unusual deal in one respect. Clifford wants to keep Patton and Dream Center non-profit. I think it's a th I think it's two or three million bucks in the first 12 months is what I'm hearing. Yeah. But Clifford's negotiated it so that if he can't find enough charitable donors, he can bring in investors and take Dream Center College for profit. Because we can always go raise capital for a for-profit strategic alliance between the two. I don't really understand how it all works with investors coming in and, and why would investors invest in this and not the Apollo Group and it's a startup company and what's the what's what's the payback? In reality this is a three to seven million dollar project. I'm very thankful that Patton has the opportunity that it has at this time. But I'm very concerned about education as a business for profit and that's simply speaking to a personal bias. So we need to make sure though the issues on financial aid and all that are buttoned down. Clifford would like to get this deal done soon. What's happening is the reg current regulatory environment is very different than it was one year ago. He's worried that the political winds in Washington are shifting. I cannot assume that the DOE or the regional accrediting bodies are going to act like they did a year ago. It's extremely hostile out there toward changes. You know, we just don't want any blowups. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much for holding this, this hearing. Last fall, for the first time in eight years, the House Committee on Education held a hearing about the for-profit schools. It seems to me the student's a bit of a pawn here. With $20 billion of federal student loans and grants funneled to the industry each year, Congress is considering stepping up its oversight. I'm asking what happens to the student out there. Uh, They're hearing troubling stories about some of the school's aggressive recruitment practices. At two separate proprietary schools. We went to talk to President Obama's new Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, to get his take on the for-profits. I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with a for-profit educating students, um, where they are providing them with a great education, where they're being honest about it, where there's value for uh, for the investment. Um, and long term, you want to see those players, you know, do well. But where they're there's high pressure tactics, where there are deceptive tactics, where there is dishonesty. Um, we have to challenge that in a very serious way. The government has been involved in a number of lawsuits in recent years. One of the biggest was against the University of Phoenix and dealt with a rule concerning something called incentivized compensation. It stipulates that schools cannot pay enrollment counselors based solely on the number of students they recruit. The concern is that they're bringing in students who can't succeed or graduate just so the recruiter can make more money. If you're paid based on how many people you enroll, you'll enroll pretty much anybody. With no admission of wrongdoing, Phoenix avoided a trial last year by settling out of court with the government and two whistleblowers for $67 million.
a number of former students from other schools are also filing suits. I believed a lot of lies that were told to me, and it wasn't until after the fact that I'm finding out it was anything but the truth. Sherry Hafferkamp was looking to get a master's degree in psychology when she talked to an enrollment counselor at Argosy University in North Dallas, Texas. The guy I talked to was personable. He seemed like he really wanted to get to know me. We had a really good conversation, and then he said, you know, instead of applying for the master's program, go ahead and apply for the doctorate program. They've got two spots available, so you better apply right now. And so I was thinking, heck yeah, I'm going to hurry and apply. Just the thought of, oh my goodness, I could be a doctor in psychology, that'd be great. I went ahead and I applied. According to Hafferkamp, Argosy told her that the degree was going to be accredited by the American Psychological Association. They told me that I had nothing to worry about, and the only reason why we're not APA accredited is because we are new to the Dallas area. In fact, Argosy Dallas never did obtain APA accreditation. Hafferkamp has now joined with 17 other former Argosy students and filed a lawsuit claiming she was defrauded. In a letter to Frontline, Argosy's parent company, EDMC, says Argosy Dallas continues to aspire to APA accreditation and rejects any charges of fraud. Hafferkamp has since moved to Maryland, where she can't hang a shingle without an APA accredited degree. I really am at a dead end. I don't know which way to go, and the student loans are going to keep mounting and mounting and mounting. Haffer Camp is now sinking in over $100,000 of federal student loans. This debt is almost impossible to escape. If you default on a federal student loan, you will be hounded for life. Barmat Nasserian is a Washington representative of traditional colleges. It is the most collectible kind of debt there is. It is non-dischargeable in bankruptcy. They will garnish your wages. They will intercept your, your tax refunds. They, they, they will sue you in court. There is all kinds. You become ineligible for federal employment. You become ineligible for any other kind of federal benefit. Increasingly, many states piggyback those prohibitions. So it is, it is, it, it, it ruins you. What was I doing before? Just hanging around at home, quick money job. Everest College is part of Corinthian Colleges, Inc., one of the biggest players in the for-profit market. Everest held out the promise of a bright future to three nursing students. They said that we were going to be making $25 an hour. And 25 to 35, yeah. they told me. It's like, how, you know, you're yeah, going to find us a job. They're going to find us a, they're going to place us because they have a lot of connections and they're big. So I was like, okay, this is good. This is good. Why shouldn't we? Why shouldn't we, huh? They each paid almost $30,000 for a 12-month program. I got my license in December of 2009, and I've been on countless interviews, and um, they all asked if I'd ever been in a hospital, and I would have to tell them, we never set foot in a hospital, ever. We went to a museum of Scientology for our psychiatric rotation. Our pediatrics rotation, we went to a daycare. Oh yeah, that was our case. We went to a daycare. <laughs> Despite graduating and getting licenses, all three women have since struggled to find jobs, claiming they didn't have the right training. In fact, they were given no practical experience in hospitals, as they say they were promised, only in nursing homes and health clinics. We asked Corinthian Colleges about this. They responded by letter, stating that the nurses' course provided thorough and appropriate training, and that students were fully informed that sites were subject to change at any time. The women want their money back, and along with 10 others in their class, are considering a lawsuit. Let me ask you about these nursing students at Corinthian. Mm -hmm. We talked about the nurses with Harris Miller. They have $30,000 in debt. Right. What can they do? Well, the government can basically wipe that out. I mean, the government has the ability to, if these, if these allegations are correct, and these students were misled, the government can do a lot of things if they're true. I, I present we asked Secretary Duncan about the nurses' claims and what Miller had said. And he said 
if they determine that the allegations are correct, the government can wipe out their debt. Is that true? I don't know if we have the ability to wipe out, wipe out their debt. And again, that's the wrong answer. The wrong, the right answer is to stop that bad, bad, that bad practice. Well, well, clearly that would be a good idea to stop that. But I mean, I was surprised to hear from the chief lobbyist to sort of pass this off and say, well, the government can wipe that out. Okay. You can't wipe that out. No, sir. We are very concerned about the amount of debt that students are taking on, whether that be uh, federal student loans as well as private loans. Student debt is a big concern in Congress today, conjuring fears of a looming default crisis reminiscent of the subprime mortgage debacle. It's not a small matter. Outstanding student loans across all college sectors are roughly equal to America's total credit card debt, about $750 billion. It sort of reminds me where we were two years ago with liar loans and no-doc loans in, 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 in the housing market, where people started accepting people who couldn't prove their income, couldn't prove employment, but we sold them a $450,000 house. But the for-profits maintain their business practices are sound, and they don't have a loan default problem. Magazine, we have a school, a welding school, where the default rate is less than one-half of one percent. And in the GAO report, Mr. Scott and his colleagues reported that they found many schools in our sector with very low default rates, including even a few in inner city. So clearly they're doing... Ninety percent of our students are in adequate loan repayment, so apparently they are finding ways to repay their loans. You're saying ninety percent of the students are paying back their loans? They're not, they're not in default, right? So ten percent are in default? Ten or eleven percent is the last official figure. Some are higher, some are lower. Yes, that's, that's the average. We constantly hear declarations of good news. All of the official stakeholders tout. What strikes one as impressively low default rates. Well, of course, the reason is because we're not counting all of them. In federal financial aid, because of very heavy lobbying by institutions, default is defined as non-repayment within a very narrow window currently only two years from the first date that you enter repayment. So if you can push defaults outside of that window, they go away. They don't exist. They don't count. Nasirian believes the default rate at for-profits could be as high as 50%. And consider it another way. According to current government figures, for-profit students are much more likely to default on their loans. They represent just 10% of all college students but nearly half of all defaults. They have about 10% of the students. They have about 44% of all student defaults. That sounds like there's a bigger problem than just a few bad apples. It's something we need to watch. Are you? Uh, yes, uh, we are. I mean, you've been in office now for a year. What have you done to stop this? Uh, we have some work to do. And uh, you know, we have not, the, the, the clear answer is we haven't stopped it. Um, we have challenged some folks. We've had some actually, I would say, slaps. We've had some pretty significant uh, financial settlements. And uh, we're going through a process now, and we're thinking through what additional steps we need to take. In a cramped conference room packed with Wall Street investors and lobbyists, Department of Education regulators are attempting to negotiate new rules to try to stem the growing number of defaults. One of the most contentious is a proposed rule on something called gainful employment which requires that upon graduation, students should be able to find employment sufficient to pay back their loans. It's a sort of direct test of whether for-profit colleges actually fulfill the role that they say that they serve. If you're uh, being sold a bill of goods, if you're told you're going back to train to be a policeman, and ends up being trained to be a you know, minimum wage security guard, there's a problem with that. If you're being told you're trained to be a nurse, and taking out loans that you know associated with that potential income salary, and you're actually going to be just drawing blood. There's a problem with that. The gainful employment test, if passed, will apply only to for-profit schools and some vocational programs at other colleges. The for-profit colleges, I think, this makes them very nervous. They're worried because they know that many of their members are charging a lot of money. That many of their members have students who are defaulting en masse after they graduate. They're afraid that this rule will cut them out of the program, but in many ways, that's the point. Yeah, exactly. 
it's the largest accrediting body, so it took the hit because it's so big. It has 1,600 schools. That would mean back in his West Coast offices, Clifford is feeling the pressure from regulators as well. Today, he's having to calm a nervous investor. You know, it's a bump in the road, and unfortunately, it's a slap in the face to George and Jennifer and the people who've been working so hard. His Chancellor University, a school purchased with help from Jack Welch, has come under scrutiny. Chancellor is under a close watch. When we see a problematic institution being acquired and being changed, we put it on a very short leash. Sylvia Manning is the new president of the Higher Learning Commission, the regional accreditor that oversees Chancellor. Under her leadership, the commission is taking a harder stance against accreditation buying. We've elevated the scrutiny tremendously. It is really inappropriate uh, for accreditation to be purchased the way you know, a taxi license can be purchased. Every so often, an institution can't or won't measure up, and accreditation is withdrawn. For Jack Welch, this is just the price of doing business. We're not going to stop educating people because we're afraid of some bureaucrat nailing us with an eye and a dotted eye and a cross T. There's always a risk. You can't be afraid to go into a business because of regulation risk. We're working very hard to prove that we can instill the academic rigor and quality of education for the students that the school had not been delivering for many, many years. Because you don't want to see that accreditation get pulled when you're correct. But we halfway down the road. We won't work with a school unless the regulatory authorities want us to work with the school. I mean, Wall Street says, hey, we put our money up, we own this business, it's ours, and we're going to run it. The regulation community says these are entities that are part of the public trust. They were nonprofit. You've converted them to for profit, but they still have a public mission to educate our society. And that's where the big tug of war has been. But life's too short to be at war with everybody. And I don't believe the regulators are our enemies. This tug of war between regulators and investors has put Wall Street on edge. Short sellers have entered the fray. Betting education stocks will fall. Check out Apollo Group. After the close, the earnings came out. They were many better than expected, but they might face a million and a half in liabilities and some open-ending report released from the Department of Education. The industry is fighting hard against the regulations. Washington lobbyists have descended on Capitol Hill with donations in hand, and they are starting to have an effect. In March, 18 congressmen and women from both sides of the aisle signed a letter to Secretary of Education Duncan, urging him to soften his proposed gainful employment rule change. It shouldn't surprise anybody that a tremendous amount of money goes into lobbying here. The one requirement here for all of the rest of their practices to ensue is that billions of dollars of federal money flow with no accountability no oversight and minimal regulations. And for that to happen, they need to pay attention to Washington and they do. Every American will need to get more than a high school diploma. And by 2020, America will once again have the highest proportion of college graduates in the world. Soon after he took office, President Obama pledged as much as $12 billion to expand America's community colleges. This year, after a fierce debate in Congress, the amount was slashed to just $2 billion. It appears that if the President wants to get more Americans to go back to school, he's going to need the for-profit sector. The Obama administration realizes that the for-profit colleges are going to have to continue to grow in order for the administration to meet its college graduation goals. They're almost getting to the point where they're too big to fail. There'd just be too many students left out on the street with nowhere to go. What happens to these students? Where do they go next? They're certainly not going to go to the community colleges. There's certainly not going to be loads of classrooms available at the state schools. They're cutting back. The for-profits make it easier for them to actually get what they need. So why shouldn't they make money on it? I mean, ultimately, that's part of what the American dream is all about. But is education a business? 
I believe so. Listen, I'm happy that there are places in the world where people sit down and think, we need that. Um, but that, that's very expensive. Mm -hmm. And not everybody can do that. And so for the vast majority of folks who, who don't get that don't get that privilege, then I think it's a business. Just last week, a senior Department of Education official promised more scrutiny of for-profit schools. Their stocks fell. But in Los Angeles, Michael Clifford's Dream Center College is accepting students for the fall of 2010. For now, it remains a non-profit. A plan to build a for-profit online program has not been finalized. Meanwhile, Clifford's busy expanding into American College. He's renamed it United States University. Hello. Oh, I'm right in the middle of a meeting, but you're so important, I had to drop everything. <laughs> Very difficult. Very difficult. 好，我们先休息呃休息五分钟就回来讨论一下最后的二十五分钟好了，谢谢。